lecture of normal psychology. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the personality disorders. The specific personality disorders. I want to spend a little time thinking about what is a personality disorder in general. Let's go back to our definition of disorder that we talked about uh, in the second lecture for the class. We said that a disorder represents a dysfunction in thought, behavior, or emotion. It has to cause impairment. It has to result in personal distress for the individual. It has to violate social norms. And we can see how each of the disorders that we've covered so far, whether it's depression or schizophrenia or the dissociative disorders, how each of them falls into uh, those areas. Some of them really hit all of them. Uh, some of them hit a couple of them, but uh, we can see how that kind of covers them. Now, each of those disorders are uh, recognized as kind of individual disorders. Uh, they're present for a given set amount of time for the individual when they're suffering from them. But let's now look at personality disorders. The definition of personality is the combination of characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. So take a moment. Combine those two definitions. What do you come up with? What is a personality disorder? And when you come up with your own definition, think, well, how is that then different uh, from the other disorders that we've talked about so far? <coughs> so combining those two, somehow, you know, maybe you came up with a definition that it's some aspect to the individual's characteristic, their character, their qualities, characteristics, who they are as an individual somehow represents a dysfunction, causes impairment, results in personal distress, or violates social norms. So if we want to compare and contrast, we're not just talking about duration of time as a difference for these disorders and the other disorders that we've talked about. Because when we look at something like schizophrenia, that's often a life long disorder, uh, especially if there is no treatment in place. Bipolar disorder, similar, uh, very long-standing, even generalized anxiety disorder or persistent depressive disorder. Uh, those are seen long-term for the individual. So it's not just duration of time, but instead we're saying that it's something about that individual's characteristics that uh, seem to be off, seem to be uh, causing a problem or violating the norms that we would expect in our society. So rather than it being something that's affecting them, somehow their characteristics that are causing the problems. Think about that last question now. What does it mean to have a disorder of the personality? And as you think about that, I, I want to say that these disorders that we're going to be talking about today are perhaps the most stigmatizing of the mental health disorders. Uh, really, individuals who suffer from these disorders uh, experience a number of kind of negative attitudes uh, from others around them, their social supports, things like that, but also within the mental health community. There is a lot of stigma and a lot of negative attitudes uh, towards some of these disorders in particular. And I think it ties back to that definition. Our thoughts that this is a disorder of the person's characteristics or qualities, who they are. Uh, now, the DSM has uh, made recent advancements in kind of moving away from that idea. Previously in the DSM, there were two kind of levels of diagnosis. Level one would be all of the diagnoses that we've talked about uh, 
us so far. And then level two was the personality disorders, uh, kind of considering them as a separate, distinct thing, uh, distinct area of problems that an individual has. But now they've changed that and they've moved the personality disorders to be on the same level with the others. But it's uh, trying to say it's not something special about these individuals, but it's a problem, just like all the other mental health problems that we have. A second kind of shift to kind of move away from the stigmatization uh, associated with these disorders is how we view them. Previously, uh, these disorders were viewed as kind of having very strict uh, boundaries to them. And what I mean by that is there's strict kind of sets of symptoms that are there. And a person either has the disorder or they don't. There's kind of a black or white line if they cross that line, the disorder is there. Now the field is starting to see these disorders as more of a continuum, that we all have a personality. And our personality, all of our personalities, have some elements of these disorders. And it's a continuum. And there's no kind of distinct line but there's just a point where it starts to cause more and more problems in our environment. It causes more and more impairment and more and more distress. And so it's at that point that it's the disorder. But, uh, but these may be common things that all of us kind of experience uh, without the level of kind of stress that would say that the disorder is there. So kind of two changes, trying to destigmatize these personality disorders. I really want you to think about those changes, though, and, and think about kind of your own personality as we cover uh, this lecture and see if any of these elements you see in your own personality and think about what you can do to destigmatize these disorders. It's a personality disorder. The diagnostic criteria for any personality disorder includes certain elements. And one element is it has to be an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture. And the pattern has to show up in at least two of the following areas. So it has to show up in their thoughts, their emotions and emotional reactions to the environment, their interpersonal functioning or relationships to others, and their impulse control or the decision-making abilities that they have. The pattern has to be inflexible and pervasive across situations. Uh, so it, it's got to show up in kind of all settings. It's this person's way of interacting in, in all environments. And there may be some situations where it's not as present, but uh, it's pretty consistently there. And, uh, and long standing there. Uh, you see in that table there, kind of estimates, untreated uh, estimates for how likely a person will experience the disorder from one time point to the next. And you see that for the four of the personality disorders, and we're going to cover more than just those four, but for four of them, if you were to take an individual that had one of them at, at time one, and then you were to follow up with them in six months, what's the likelihood that they would still have the disorder? and 60% of them would still have it at six months. You can compare that with depression. Uh, if you take an individual with depression, they don't have a personality disorder, and you checked up with them in six months, only about 5% would still have that disorder. And then you can look at the graph, the figures for 12 months and 24 months. We're ranging you know, somewhere between about 35% uh, up to about 55% are still going to have the disorder after one year or two years. Again, that's compared to depression, where at one year it might be just 2%, and uh, at uh, two years, uh, maybe non-existent. Um, so kind of long-standing pattern. Last, like I mentioned, it has to cause distress and impairment. And oftentimes with personality disorders, it's distress and impairment for the individual, 
that typically these disorders cause distress and impairment for those in the individual's social circle. So for their family members, for their friends as well. Main clusters of the personality disorders are they're grouped into three core areas. The first cluster are the odd and eccentric types. We'll talk about those. Second cluster, cluster B, are the dramatic, emotional, erratic types. And then finally, cluster C, the anxious or fearful types. personality disorder. We talked a little bit about uh, a similar kind of problem when we covered schizophrenia in the last lecture. We talked about delusions and how individuals with delusions might be paranoid. Uh, they might worry that others are out to get them. Uh, others are persecuting them in some way. Now paranoid personality disorder is that very thing except uh, rather than having the other symptoms of schizophrenia, uh, these individuals are, the disorders just focused on that. So pervasive distress and suspiciousness of others, uh, uh, always interpreting the motive of others as um, uh, kind of harmful, that people are going to be out to get them. And uh, so kind of have to have at least four of the symptoms kind of listed up there. So uh, sp suspects others are trying to hurt them in some way, as preoccupied with kind of doubts of others' loyalty and trust, even with close friends. Or like I mentioned in last lecture, especially and this shows up with, uh, say, a spouse or a significant other. These individuals are reluctant to confide in others because of that fear. And in fact, uh, it's often that they don't have very many close relationships at all uh, because they have too much fear to uh, engage in behaviors that would give them those types of relationships. Even benign things, they kind of read as uh, demeaning or threatening. They hold grudges uh, and... Um, they kind of want to uh, react strongly um, uh, whenever somebody has, per uh, whenever they perceive somebody as having wronged them. Mentioned this is different from the paranoia with schizophrenia, um, and some of the differences they don't have the rest of those schizophrenic symptoms. But also, with this, uh, the thoughts are, are typically possible. And so they don't uh, perceive some type of special message coming to them. Or they don't uh, believe that something was implanted in their brain. Or it's aliens that are out to get them. Uh, but it's actual things in their environment. So it could be possible. It, it, it's not likely you know, uh, most people aren't uh, wanting to harm them, or most people uh, are trustworthy, uh, but uh, they just can't see that in anybody. It's also different from individuals who have a reason to distrust. Uh, um, there are times when somebody would be upset at somebody else, or would have a justified reason not to trust them, and that's okay. Uh, this disorder is a distrust of everyone, uh, even those who uh, should be trusted. And it's thought that this disorder actually occurs in about 2 to 4 percent of the population. There's a schizoid personality disorder. The schizoid personality disorder we see a real detachment from uh, one's environment, and particularly from the social relationships in one's environment. Uh, the individual neither enjoys uh, nor desires to have really any close relationships, uh, including being part of a family, uh, being part of their family growing up, or being, uh, you know, starting their own family. Uh, that's just not desired by them at all. 
and so they usually choose solitary activities. And this is a uh, different from being shy or being an introvert, and also different from, say, social phobia, where the individual fears that they might be judged by others, and so they avoid those social relationships. Here, the individual just doesn't have any interest in that. Um, they don't want to engage in others. Um, in addition to just not wanting to engage in others, they generally take uh, uh, have few things that they actually find uh, pleasurable, uh, that they enjoy doing. And they tend not to really express any emotions, uh, whether it's in interpersonal relationships or even by themselves. Uh, they don't have the same level of emotional experience. Um, yeah, so oftentimes these individuals are described as kind of cold or detached or uh, just flat. Um, sometimes uh, these individuals are uh, said and called antisocial. You'll hear that word kind of among friends. Somebody will say, oh, you're not coming to the party. Why do you have to be so antisocial? And that's an important thing to watch out for. Uh, because antisocial is actually a completely different personality disorder that uh, has a totally different kind of picture on it. Um, so it doesn't fit at all uh, with how it's most commonly used. Um, yeah. That kind of flattened emotion, so they rarely experience or express strong emotions. Uh, especially anger, um, so and they're, you're, you're not going to get them blowing up at you. So this is very different from paranoid personality disorder where they're going to be more explosive whenever they feel like they're threatened in some way. Here, uh, it will seem like they weren't even affected at all, even if somebody does a major kind of uh, crime against them. Also, individuals uh, in this will rarely kind of admit to pain, uh, uh, pain related to kind of social interactions, that they were hurt by anything. Um, these individuals tend to appear directionless in life and kind of adrift in their goals. They don't have that emotions to motivate them often, and so they tend to not be motivated to do well in school or do well at work, things like that. Happy, but just more meaning, uh, meaningless or menial jobs. Also, they don't tend to respond to major life events. So if, you know, by chance they did get married or if, you know, they had a child or uh, had even like a 50th birthday, uh, to them it'd just be another day. Uh, you wouldn't really see any excitement or any uh, nervousness or hesitation. Um, it's just another thing that happened in their life. Uh, these individuals tend to work in isolation. During periods of, of high levels of distress, um, so if something happens, traumatic events or chaotic you know, environment, there may be very short psychotic episodes associated with this disorder uh, that would look like schizophrenia, uh, but uh, they'd be short periods, you know, maybe uh, maybe a day or, or even less, just a matter of hours uh, while the stressor is present. It's estimated that about 4% of the population may have uh, some form of this disorder but it's rare that an individual with this disorder would ever seek out treatment. Think about that for a second. Why do you think individuals with these disorders, this disorder rarely seeks out treatment? So with this, uh, the individuals aren't necessarily bothered uh, by the problems. Remember, they don't experience the same kind of emotions, uh, and so it's not a big deal if they don't have a lot of friends. They don't care about having friends, uh, so it's not a big deal to them. Also, oftentimes, 
individuals seek out mental health help when they've been encouraged by their family members and friends, but these individuals have isolated themselves so much that they don't get that encouragement from anyone. They also, because of their isolation, um, they tend to not get into trouble like we see with other disorders. So they're not out there doing risky things or uh, breaking the law in some way, but they're just kind of keeping to themselves. Category is schizotypal personality disorder. And now, uh, important uh, to recognize these two disorders, schizoid and schizotypal, they sound a lot alike, and so people often confuse them, uh, mix them up. And so be careful on your exam. Uh, make sure as you take that that you have the difference between these two down really well. With schizotypal personality disorder, this is where we see much more of the oddities uh, going on. Uh, so a little bit closer to what maybe we'd expect from schizophrenia, uh, but in a personality disorder form. Um, and so here we see uh, ideas of reference, that people uh, you know, are thinking that uh, they're the center and, and somehow people are trying to communicate to them. Uh, when they read a book, there's some reference to them in that book. Uh, not just that, oh, I can apply this to my life in some way, but the author, you know, from 200 years ago has had a special message to give just to me, and here's uh, what that message is. Um, and these oddities with this disorder tend to show up mostly in relationships. Um, and so we see both the oddities in thinking and the oddities in behavior. Um, so odd beliefs, magical thinking, there may be unusual perceptual experiences, including bodily illusions. These oftentimes don't go to the extreme of uh, hallucination that we see in schizophrenia, but, uh, but kind of the oddities are there. Uh, same thing with thinking and speech. It's odd thinking, but again, not to the extreme level with schizophrenia. And then oftentimes there is some suspiciousness or paranoia uh, here and also limited affect or not always limited but uh, could be kind of inappropriate doesn't fit what they're talking about and so an example worked with an individual with this and talking about uh, the death of a family member and uh, as they were talking about it just very kind of uh, back and forth with crying and laughing uh, and just flat uh, so kind of all over the place um, with the emotions that didn't quite fit what they were saying. These individuals also often lack close friends or confidence, social supports, other than their first degree relatives, but it's different from schizoid. Now these individuals want the close friends and relatives, and where schizoid they don't want them, so that's why they don't have them. These individuals do want them, but um, they're so awkward and odd uh, that they have difficulty kind of making those close friends and maintaining those relationships. Also, with this disorder, we tend to see a lot of social anxiety. Again, schizoid, there is no social anxiety. They don't care uh, what others might think. They don't care about having those relationships at all. Here, these individuals do highly value those relationships, uh, but uh, uh, because they're so odd in them and have so many failures in them, that they have a lot of anx anxiety about those relationships not lasting. And and it's in social anxiety we talked about how it goes away with familiarity as the person gets to know the, the individual better than they are not as anxious and it's not there with family members but the schizotypal personality disorder uh, that doesn't happen um, it's still kind of there even as somebody gets more familiar with the person personality disorder um, um, it was uh, more recently uh, also placed with the schizophrenia spectrum disorders 
So it's still a personality disorder, but if you look it up in the DSM, it's going to show up or be mentioned in both places. Uh, important to recognize, different from schizophrenia though, in that uh, you don't have quite the extremes in the hallucinations or the, the logical thinking, um, uh, logical uh, disorganized speech, things like that. Uh, but this one, although it's not at the extremes of that, it's more kind of consistent and long-standing in all situations. Um, uh, and so it's not discrete episodes like we might see in schizophrenia. It can have very brief psychotic episodes, again, similar to schizoid personality disorder in times of stress, but those are very short duration, again, uh, rather than the longer uh, psychotic episodes that you'll see in schizophrenia. Now, these two disorders may co-occur. Uh, an individual may have schizotypal personality disorder, which is kind of the uh, always present uh, aspect of their personality that's always there. And then they may have schizophrenia, which shows up in more extreme episodes that, you know, are six months or, or so where they have a psychotic break. Also, depression frequently co-occurs with this disorder. And it makes sense, you know, if the individual highly does value the social relationships, but then they have a lot of social anxiety about them, and they don't perform well in them because of the oddities in their behavior and thinking, that they would experience a lot of depression about that. Similar to schizoid personality disorder, estimated to occur in about 4% of the population. Let's switch then to the cluster B personality disorders. Uh, cluster A personality disorders uh, are problematic and often very distressing for individuals, uh, but oftentimes individuals with those disorders tend to isolate, uh, uh, whether by choice or uh, because of the oddities in their behaviors. Cluster B personality disorders uh, are more about the interpersonal relationships. Uh, people either uh, with these disorders use them to their advantage or uh, really have vo volatile uh, interpersonal relationships. So really a strong element to these cluster B personality disorders. These are the, uh, the cluster B personality disorders are the ones that um, we call the dramatic, emotional, and erratic types. Antisocial personality disorder. Remember, this has nothing to do with being uh, having social phobia or uh, not having interest in social relationships. Instead, antisocial personality disorder uh, it's all about uh, uh, violating kind of the rights of others and not really caring about it. So these are individuals who uh, tend to lack empathy and are really just focused on themselves. They kind of put themselves and, and what they feel they deserve or should get above anyone else. Uh, so an example of this, a, a person may still uh, and think, well, if I want it, I should have it. It doesn't matter if somebody else paid for it, it should be mine because I want it. So getting a little bit deeper with this one into the symptoms. So this disorder in particular uh, does have a set age of onset. It has to be present before the age of 15, uh, or evidence of it has to be there uh, before the age of 15. And in fact, uh, the person may have not actually received the diagnosis by a psychologist, but uh, if they would have, you know, there has to be evidence that a conduct disorder would have been present before the age of 15. And then after, uh, we see this pattern of uh, failure to conform to the social norms regarding lawful behaviors, 
so uh, it, it doing major kind of things that uh, they would be arrested for, thrown in jail for, uh, if they were caught, being deceitful, lying without uh, any concern of that, and really conning others for their own personal gain. We often see impulsivity or failure to plan ahead with this disorder, and aggressiveness, uh, repeated kind of physical fights or assaults with others. And with that, uh, not even thinking about the safety of others at all, not caring about the safety of others. They're just focused on themselves. Uh, these individuals have often have a repeated failure to sustain kind of work behavior, uh, honor financial obligations. Uh, so they often have difficulty, you know, uh, uh, successfully holding a job. Now that's not all of them. Some individuals with this disorder are in fact very successful. Um, there's a lot of variety, uh, but they can use kind of uh, their charm and uh, uh, be charismatic and use that in a way to get away with things. And so sometimes you'll even see this in CEOs of companies where um, they get arrested and thrown in jail for uh, stealing, you know, millions and millions of dollars from uh, the company or uh, from um, the shareholders or things like that. Uh, and usually these individuals, I mean, they may regret uh, getting caught and getting thrown in jail, but even when they're caught, uh, they don't have any remorse about it. They don't see it as a problem. They're indifferent uh, to the pain or suffering that they may have caused by others. It's estimated that a sizable portion of the, the individuals in prison or jail um, have some form of this antisocial personality disorder. Uh, now, uh, many in the prison system are not, you know, but uh, those kind of repeat offenders who uh, don't really care uh, uh, about breaking the law at all um, are thought to have some form of this disorder. This is also the disorder that we're talking about when we talk about uh, like serial killers, uh, individuals who go on these killing sprees without any sign of regret or remorse about doing it. It's a game to them. They do it for their own pleasure. Um, there's some really interesting videos uh, that you can look, interviews with individuals with antisocial personality disorder. I didn't post any to the Moodle site, but you can look online uh, to see some of uh, famous cases. And there's a few videos online that uh, also display videos of children that uh, seem to have evidence of this disorder. Now remember though, if a child displays all of these symptoms, they wouldn't get a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Under the age of 15, the diagnosis would be conduct disorder. And then after the age of 15, it would turn into antisocial. And I think that's actually a very stigmatizing. If somebody has it on their medical record or things like that, and doctors won't want to work with them, um, it's often scary, you know, um, uh, to work with these individuals. And so, uh, to not put it on a child's record and to kind of wait and see, um, uh, I think is a good idea. Um, I mentioned some of the kind of personality traits of these individuals, but um, they tend to be callous, cynical, uh, and really contemptuous. If, if somebody else is suffering or if they have to spend time, you know, uh, say with a child who's crying or something like that, it's really more so seen as a nuisance um, uh, that's kind of impeding them from being able to do what they'd like in their life. Now, they can uh, recognize, though, uh, social cues, and many of them are really great at recognizing social cues and doing what they need to within society but they do that in order to get ahead for themselves. They do it in order to be able to take advantage of others better.
oftentimes their individuals with this disorder have had experiences with child abuse or neglect or some type of inconsistent erratic parenting and and so you can uh, uh, perhaps see how m maybe this disorder would develop in an individual if their caregivers who represent the world at an early young age teach them that the world is inconsistent, the world doesn't care about them, uh, then you can see how they might start to develop the ideas that they don't have to care about the world at all. It's estimated uh, less than 1% of the population, but like I mentioned, in prison settings, some estimates say it's about 70% of those in prison have this disorder. It's also seen at higher rates in uh, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, locations, those with poverty. Uh, and think about your own beliefs about kind of our morals and ethics as a society. And I want you to think, do you believe that individuals are born with a set of moral codes? Do you believe that people are born knowing right and wrong? There's something in them automatically, uh, they come into this world with an idea what's right or wrong. If you say yes, I want you to then think, how do some people go from knowing right and wrong to the extreme uh, behaviors that are seen with antisocial personality disorder? How do they lose that ability or get rid of that ability to listen to right and wrong and just not care about others anymore? If you say no, if you think people aren't born with an innate kind of idea of right and wrong, what do you think then is the process that leads some people to, to develop empathy and a recognition that others have rights? and other people to not really care at all for those antisocial personalities. What do you think leads to that? Is it the environment? Is it choices that they make? What happens uh, to the individual who develops this disorder? Again, several different, as you think about that, you know, if you, if it's kind of a fascinating thought to you or something you're really interested in, there's been several different movies uh, put out by, uh, and other media sources um, about this disorder. And so uh, feel free to kind of dig deeper. And before we move ahead, so it's thought that with this disorder, uh, these individuals care a lot about what, what others think about them. So kind of the opposite of antisocial personality disorder. Um, um, with this disorder, uh, the individuals crave the attention by others uh, and they're not callous to it. And so they'll go to kind of all lengths um, to try to get that attention. And I realized that uh, as I went back in the slide that I may have uh, recorded over uh, the description I gave before, but if I did, uh, feel free to read through kind of the symptoms of the slide. Like I mentioned, kind of just briefly, uh, these individuals want to be the center of attention. They use their body, the way they talk, and the way they act, all to bring the attention to themselves. With this one, uh, uh, see if you can think about any celebrities that maybe fit this uh, description of histrionic personality disorder. This uh, uh, is definitely something that we might see uh, there and, and some of the patterns in the media and the way certain celebrities kind of interact with the media. Um, yeah. This is narcissistic personality disorder. 
this one is a little bit more similar to antisocial uh, um, in that uh, the person believes that they are greater somehow than others. Uh, with this one, it's not that they don't care about others. Uh, and these individuals may experience kind of empathy and understand what others are going through, uh, not to the, at all to the same degree as uh, m most people in the population, way less than that, but perhaps a little more than what we see with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, but here they just believe that they're better than everybody else. So they have this grandiose sense of self-importance. -import they have these huge ideas that somehow they are, you know, going to be the most successful, most brilliant, uh, most loved person in the world. Even, you know, if these individuals are, you know, say, failing out of high school, they somehow believe that they are uh, going to solve all of the world's problems. They'll be the president of the United States, so uh, whatever. Um, they just believe that they could do anything. They're unique, they have special rights, they're, yeah, uh, kind of above everybody else. And they believe that they, because of those uniqueness and special rights, that uh, they should be admired by everybody, that people should pay attention to them and, and give them everything they want. They also believe that others are generally envious of them or uh, want to be like them. If somebody gets upset with them because of the way they're acting, uh, they're only getting upset because they'd like to be like them themselves. With narcissistic personality disorder, uh, it's different from antisocial and maybe similar to histrionic in that underlying uh, this, these symptoms or underlying their presentation, uh, it's thought to actually be insecurity. And so with histrionic, the insecurity leads to them trying to seduce people and bring the attention to themselves. With narcissistic, the underlying insecurity results in kind of an over-exaggeration uh, of uh, their sense of self and importance. But it's thought that that's really kind of a facade that they put on protecting their insecure self. It's interesting, in our generation, uh, a lot of people have uh, kind of um, suggested that we nowadays train people uh, toward these narcissistic and histrionic traits. That um, what started as kind of a good movement uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, saying that everyone is special and saying that you know you can achieve whatever you want and uh, your dreams and, and you know you are important has turned into maybe a culture of narcissistic and histrionic personality disorder where people are focused just on themselves that they're of an ultimate importance that everybody cares about them and we see it with social media. Uh, we see it with um, you know the advancements in technology and how we now interact often with others. Uh, focus on the self much more. Disorder within this category is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder, again, has this core piece of feelings of insecurity. They feel like interpersonal relationships. They value them highly, but they feel like they're insecure. And so what we see here is a pattern of, of taking drastic behaviors to try to preserve uh, those relationships. And so what we see are frantic efforts to try to avoid uh, real or imagined abandonment, unstable, intense interpersonal relationships uh, that move back and forth between the extremes, being loved 
you know, thinking somebody's the greatest and in love with them one moment, but then moving to the, the most horrible person in the world the next moment. We see uh, unstable self-image with this disorder as well. Uh, oftentimes, kind of, at times feeling like uh, they're important, but then other times feeling like they have no self-worth at all. And so with this um, um, kind of insta instability in their self-image and sense of self, we often see kind of periods of, of depression and those low kind of swings. Uh, at times they may, you know, cut themselves is a very kind of common symptom of this disorder or have a pseudo suicide attempt where they're not really meaning to take their life but uh, they're trying to draw people in uh, so people don't leave them or abandon them. Uh, we also see just general feelings of emptiness um, uh, because those um, relationships they have are so chaotic they cause them to be so, so chaotic that they feel like they're empty and there is no secure relationship around them. Um, uh, but with the emptiness, and recognizing that a lot of it is they're causing the problems in the relationships, their reactivity and jumping to anger, or pulling in people and then pushing them away, uh, that often causes the isolation. In some of these I already mentioned a little bit, uh, oftentimes characterized by black and white attitudes towards relationships. Like I said, they view somebody as being the most awesome person ever or the worst person ever. Uh, I remember in one of the settings that I worked in uh, that uh, we had clients who uh, could submit kind of satisfaction surveys. And we'd have a monthly meeting and the director for that uh, clinic would pull out all the satisfaction surveys and read all of the comments that clients had put on there. And there was one therapist in particular that uh, she specialized in working with clients with borderline personality disorder. And it was always funny because she would get the best comments uh, put on there. And people would say, she is the most amazing therapist ever, uh, that they couldn't live without her, uh, things like that. But she would also get the very worst comments, people writing that they hated her, that she should be fired, that, you know, they couldn't stand her. And sometimes the comments were from the, the positive and negative were from the exact same person. Uh, and so you can see kind of the black and white kind of fluctuation in how they view people. Um, with this kind of black and white fluctuation, uh, you see kind of this fluctuation in how they interact then with people. They don't want to be abandoned, uh, but they don't know how to really interact in the, in the relationships in an appropriate way. And so you see them at times desperately pulling people in, drawing them close, mm -hmm. but then at other times pushing them away. And it's not that maybe if they push them away, uh, that it's not a true abandonment. They rejected them uh, rather than they were rejected by somebody else. Uh, it's estimated about 5% of the population experience this disorder, uh, but in outpatient settings and in inpatient settings, much higher percent of clients uh, with other mental health problems. Um, higher rates in females, definitely, but there are times when males can have it too. I have had a number of clients with this disorder and uh, have worked with males as well. Uh, and typically with males, there's a lot more anger and aggression that shows out and a little bit less kind of the dramatic uh, kind of emotional uh, crying uh, things like that uh, with this disorder there's thought to be a strong link to childhood abuse um, they learn early on that relationships and loving relationships can easily go from love and comfort to pain and harm and so they have this black and these up and down kind of uh, ways that they're viewing relationships. And that pattern then uh, they learn to respond uh, over and over as new relationships come up. The problem is most relationships aren't that way. 
And so as they continue kind of that back and forth responding uh, uh, to what might have been appropriate when somebody was loving one day and then harming them the next day, uh, uh, it, it was appropriate then, but then doesn't fit the new kind of more consistent relationships. We have the cluster C personality disorders. Now, with cluster C, these are the ones that are uh, uh, it still has to do with relationships and kind of uh, individuals' reaction in relationships, but in a much different way. Uh, these are individuals who are more, uh, you could say, uh, kind of uh, anxious in relationships, uh, that they're not really sure what the right thing is, and so they're more timid in the relationships rather than uh, kind of emotional and erratic. First uh, disorder here is avoidant personality disorder. For uh, avoidant personality disorder, the individual tends to avoid any type of social uh, interactions and relationships. They're very hypersensitive to evaluation from others, um, and so uh, they avoid kind of those judgments and being rejected at all costs. In a way, avoidant personality disorder is m most closely associated with social phobia. This is just a more kind of long-standing and pervasive uh, version of social phobia. So they view themselves as socially inept, they view themselves as personally unappealing, inferior to others, and as a result they uh, are reluctant really to engage in any relationships. Now, like I mentioned, so similar to social phobia, uh, more kind of long-standing and pervasive though, um, uh, it's uh, different from, uh, say, schizoid personality disorder. These individuals do care about the social relationships, so it's not that they're avoiding them because they don't care at all. It's also different from schizotypal personality disorder because there's not the oddities here with this disorder like you would see in that one. So like I mentioned, more long-lasting, more pervasive than social anxiety disorder. Estimated about 2.5% of adults have this. Often uh, it starts with shyness. Uh, in childhood, uh, but most individuals who are shy as children, uh, that ends up kind of going away over time. They become less shy and uh, more able to kind of engage in their social environments. But with this disorder, that shyness actually gets worse over time. These individuals, like I said, care a lot uh, still about relationships, and so if you talk to them about it, they're going to report that they're lonely going to wish that they had more relationships and as a result of that there's often depression seen with, with this disorder too. Dependent personality disorder. With dependent personality disorder these individuals uh, can often be insecure as well, have uh, kind of fears that others are going to abandon them. And so they uh, kind of take drastic and excessive uh, actions uh, to have others take care of them. And so individuals with this disorder have difficulty making any sort of decision for themselves. They always turn to others. And it's not just making decisions, but even difficulty saying their likes or you know, things like a favorite color or a favorite type of ice cream or things like that. Uh, it's, if they were asked that, they would say, well, what do you think? Uh, and, and try to get their likes from others. Um, these individuals ask others and need others to really take responsibility for most major areas of their life. Uh, so major decisions they won't want to make on their own. So decisions about going to college or uh, decisions about um, who they should date or things like that. 
and they're seeking others to make those decisions for them. But it can also be little decisions. Uh, so even what clothes to wear, uh, what food to order at the restaurant, uh, all of those small things, they depend on others uh, to make those decisions for them. Um, and um, really, if they're put in a situation where they would have to make their own decisions or have to uh, kind of do it on their own, uh, they would really feel helpless, they would really struggle. And so you see these individuals, if they're forced to be alone for some reason, they'll, rather than making the decision, so quickly try to latch on to somebody new uh, who can make the decisions for them. Uh, personality disorder that we're going to talk about is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I mentioned this one already as we talked about obsessive compulsive disorder and mentioned that it's uh, different from that one. With this one, they, there's not the typical obsessions or thoughts that keep on playing over and over in their head, the unrealistic beliefs about danger or bad things happening. Um, and there's not the resulting kind of compulsions or rituals uh, that have to be done repeatedly over and over and over to fix the obsession. Instead, this disorder is just about a pervasive pattern with orderliness, perfectionism, uh, having control over everything. So these individuals are preoccupied with details, rules, lists, organizations, schedules, and these individuals want things to be perfect. And oftentimes these individuals can be very successful in things if their environment allows them. Uh, that uh, they can be the ones who, it's not good enough to get a 98%, but they want that 110% on every assignment they do. Uh, so they work hard uh, to be productive and um, um, be successful in those things. And they work so hard that it's often uh, it comes at a cost of any leisure activities or relationships. Um, uh, you can see that just these individuals often um, it applies to several different areas of their life. This wanting things perfect, wanting things orderly. Uh, it's not just their work or their home environment that they want their uh, relationships to be perfect and they uh, want the way they spend money you know to be perfect and, and as a result they uh, oftentimes just can't be carefree uh, with a lot of these things and so that can cause problems in their relationships where uh, others can be frustrated that uh, they're not able to just let go of some of these things couple disorders to kind of think about with this one that uh, differ, differs from. I mentioned already it differs from obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, another one we want to make sure it differs from is autism. Individuals with autism also uh, have a set structure and uh, that they often like the world to follow. Uh, they have a schedule and if that schedule is kind of violated in some way it, it really throws them off. Uh, this is different. Um, um, it's uh, with autism. It's uh, more about having a limited understanding of kind of the social uh, relationships and the social kind of cues and uh, flexibility just in social things. Here, with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, it's more so everything. It's not exclusive to those social situations. It's also different from generalized anxiety disorder. If you remember, we said generalized anxiety disorder uh, is characterized by anxiety or worry about lots of different areas in their life. And because they have anxiety and worry about lots of these different areas, they put forth extra effort to make things perfect. Um, now here, with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, we also see the perfectionism. And then, and let's, for this week's lecture, uh, let's go ahead and use that as our uh, keyword. 
uh, code word to put into Moodle today. Uh, perfect. Uh, so to get credit for today's lecture, type in perfect uh, into Moodle. So like I was saying though, generalized anxiety disorder, those individuals might strive for perfectionism. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, they might strive for that as well, but it's for different reasons. With generalized anxiety disorder, it's because they feel that they worry that things are going to be out of control. They worry that bad things are going to happen. They worry that they're not going to be able to handle uh, uh, minor bad things uh, happening to them. Here, it's more about kind of their comfort. They just want things perfect. They want things orderly. It's not anxiety about it. Uh, it's just that's what's expected for them. And that's what they expect of others. Uh, make sure to watch the videos that I have posted to Moodle and then make sure to uh, type in that keyword.